I can't tell you all how grateful I am for you. I just mean this personally from Garrett. I'm so grateful for every single one of you mighty men, so grateful for a bunch of men who are willing to do this. It, it, it fires me up and encourages me, it gives strength to me that there are other men who don't wanna live their life about themselves, that there are other men who wanna live a life that, want, that is gonna honor and glorify God. It's so easy to conform to this world, but I'm so grateful to live a life surrounded by other transformed men who've said, you know what, God, I want all that you have for me. I thank every single person in this room, but you can let me know, just raise your hand. Does anybody not want greatness with their life? That's what I thought. Figured everyone here wants greatness. I know I do. I want greatness with my life. And I'm not talking about hype or fame or what the world would call status. Greatness is just all of it. It's all that God has for you. That's what I want. What a shame it would be to have a personal relationship with the creator of the universe that made you in his image, right? Just, just get this much smaller picture first. What if you had a dad who was really great? And I don't mean, you know, he, he could have been an athlete, whatever he was. Sometimes your DNA is a little bit different than your earthly father, but I feel like greatness transcends DNA. What if you had a father who was great? Anybody who's great, they have to reach for it. They have to stretch. They have to press to get everything out of what God's given them. And what if you had a father who was really great and you just decided not to be? Really, it would just be a shame. People look at those, people look at people like that and say, man, how sad is that? Came from a family of greatness, but he chose not to be great. That's what I believe for every single one of you. It doesn't matter who your daddy was. It doesn't matter how much money or a place on the earth that you came from. You have a father in heaven who's the creator of it all. He's your father, and he made you in his image. And so there's greatness for each and every one of you. I was talking this week with Pastor Keith about greatness. This is what this place is, right? This is the incubator of greatness. It's what we talk about all the time. And what my message is gonna be this morning is the path to greatness. So if you want greatness with your life, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it simple for you. I'm gonna give you the three pillars of the path to greatness. But I was talking with Pastor Keith uh, yesterday about what greatness is, and I said, Pastor, what's your definition of greatness? And, and he's given me many, but I loved what he said yesterday. He says greatness is this. This, this Nick, you'll love this. He, he said it's a belief. This is what greatness is. The belief that you have been created in the image of God and that you are supernaturally endowed by God, to think like God, be like God, and do life like God in every area of your life, right? It's you, you reaching greatness with your life. It comes with first you understanding that God made you in his image, that you were created by him with a great plan, and you can think, be, do everything in your life like him. People who aren't great, even if you, and I'm talking about a man who comes from a father who was great, he looks at his dad and goes, oh, I'm not that. You've gotta look at God and say, you made me like you. I can be like that. I can think, be, do like that. That is the beginning of, of the path to greatness for you. And we call this place the incubator of greatness. An incubator is a strategic atmosphere where you can learn to believe that, that God has a great plan for your life, that you can think, be, do like him. That's what we do every Saturday. We come to this place called the incubator of greatness. That's what we do every Sunday. We come to this place called the incubator of greatness where we get in a strategic atmosphere there's a lot of atmospheres that you're in. Maybe you don't get to choose all the places that you're in in your life. Maybe there's some places that are just transitional or seasonal for you. I hope this place is a place like my father talked about a month ago. This is a place where you can plant your flag, where you can decide I'm gonna enroll in this incubator for the rest of my life. You know what I've uh, seen, and this is, not, this is not me taking a shot at anybody, but what I've seen is sometimes when people leave this place or other Incubators. This isn't the only incubator. There's other places that develop great people. But what I've found and seen when people leave places like this is because they just decide, I don't want to press anymore. Like, I'm, when, when you start asking yourself this question, when am, when am I going to get to do what I want to do? Right? When, when, am, when am I going to be done with this development phase in my life? Jesus called us to be disciples in Matthew chapter 28. You know what disciple means? It means student. And there is a student mindset that you can have where there's always something to learn, there's always something to grow in. If, if, uh, wh where are uh, my guys in here that do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, right? All you guys that roll. 
right? The few of you that do, you, you get this. You go to a place and train with a guy who's your master and is a second degree, third degree black belt. He's a student, right? There are other people that he submits to. And if you met your, your Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu's master, he submits to somebody else that submits to somebody else, right? We have to have this mindset of being a student. For the rest of my life, I'm gonna be a student of God's way of thinking. For the rest of my life, I'm gonna be a student of the word of God. That means I haven't figured it all out. That means there's more for me to learn. There's more for me to do. That I gotta keep growing. I gotta keep training. Where you lose it on the path to greatness is you just realize, you start to choose for yourself, hey, I don't wanna be a student anymore. I was telling Nick the other day about, uh, so I left the military after my first six years. And long story short for that, I just, uh, God was revealing to me that where he, he called me into the SEAL teams, but there was more on the other side of the SEAL teams that I was supposed to do. I wanted to stay. I was doing really great. Um, I'd been asked to screen for a development group, which is like the elite of the elite of the elite. And I was telling Nick about this the other day that there's some guys who don't want that. They, um, you would think like, man, if, if I'm gonna like go play in the NFL, I wanna play on the best team. SEAL Team 6 is the best team. And I wanted to play there. And I was telling Nick, not every guy does. There's some guys in the SEAL teams that decide, I don't, I don't wanna go do the development group thing. You know why? The reason that they don't wanna do it is because if you go screen, you become a student again. You go through this years long process just to make it to the SEAL teams and then you start to develop some status and leadership and people you know, are listening to you. But if you wanna go to development group, SEAL Team 6, you become a student again. You're nobody now. Just shut up and do as you're told. There's guys with eight years, 10 years of experience, three, four combat deployments, and they get treated like a bud student. And some people decide, you know what, I don't wanna go to the next level because I don't wanna go back to being a student again. You will cap your greatness if you decide I don't wanna be a student. I'm gonna be a student forever, right? And a part of being a student, and this isn't even in my message this morning, but a part of being a student is humility. If you wanna grow to your next level, I do. So anybody else wants to go to their next level? I feel, I, I feel like I can see it. It's right there where God's trying to take me and, I, and what I've gotta do is continue to stay humble. Because as soon as I start bowing up to God and saying like, when are you gonna do this for me? Right, I, I've done my part, you need to give this to me. That is when I, I get into the path of resistance. God gives grace to the humble, but God resists the proud. Right, if you wanna go to your next level, it starts with you having this student mindset and students are humble. And, and, and just like in the SEAL teams, guys had to be a student to get to the highest level. There may be people that you have more combat deployments than them, I've killed more dudes than that dude, doesn't matter, whatever it is, you've gotta be a student to grow to your next level. So let's just decide that we all want greatness and I'm gonna have the right attitude about greatness. Pastor Keith, uh, he said this too when we were talking yesterday, he said you need to learn the path of greatness because God wants you to be a path for someone else. Nothing has shaped me in my life like the weight of leadership, right? Like, who, where, where are my married men in here? Where, keep your hand up if you got children, right? For those of you who don't have children, I believe God will give you children. But when you have children, it got, you realize, like, man, people depend on me. I got a little kid at home or multiple kids that if I don't do what I'm supposed to do, not only will I suffer, but other people will suffer, and that is a leverage point that God has created for us, right? Just like God said, you know what, Adam, it's not good that you're alone. There was a lot of things God's doing with that. I won't talk about all of them, but one of the things that God was doing with that was he says, Adam, I know this will make you better because you've got someone to lead, not just leading yourself. Pastor Keith teaches that it's a, it is a fantastic path that before you lead anything else, you have to lead yourself. But you don't have to be perfect at leading yourself. You just gotta start. Right? If you had to be perfect at leading yourself before you could lead anyone else, none of us would ever lead anybody else. But you do have to start. And if you'll start this process of leading yourself, you'll get the privilege of leading other people. And when I stepped into that in my life where God started to give me the privilege of leading other people, I can tell you nothing has pushed me forward, nothing has pulled me forward the way that the weight of leadership has. That is you realizing, like I did as a young student in the SEAL teams, that my decisions affect other people. Right, you can run hard for yourself, you can run so much harder when you realize how many people are depending on you. Just like a mother who pulls strength from the very depths of her spirit 
to rip a door off of a car when her child is trapped in a burning car. These are the same women who can't bench press 130 pounds, but when their child's life is on the line, they can pull the, the door off of a car. In the very same way, you wanna get to the greatness part of you, you wanna access the superhero that God's put in you, it starts with you understanding, not only does God have a great plan for me, not only do I need to walk this path, but by me walking this path, I open up the path for other people. So many people have opened that path for me. My dad, Pastor Keith, if they hadn't lived the life that they live, I know it encourages my father greatly. If my dad had not been the man that he is, I would not be who I am. By him walking that path, he's opened up the path that I'm on. So know that about your path of greatness. You may, maybe you don't know who it is. Maybe it's a son or a daughter for you. Maybe it's spiritual sons that have not even entered your life yet. But I want you to see, and this is part of what vision is. Vision isn't just seeing where, where you know, right now it's dirt and one day it's gonna become grass. That's not just vision. Vision is also seeing, this is seeing some of the possibility. Maybe I don't have sons yet, and I'm not just talking about me, I'm talking about you. Maybe I don't have sons yet. I don't mean just mean physical sons, spiritual sons. Maybe I don't have sons yet. Maybe I don't have a business yet. Maybe I don't have a marriage yet, and I can't see what God's going to do, but I see there's room for it. I see the possibility of what God can do. And because of what God can do, I'm gonna do all that I can do so I can see everything that God's going to do. That's the path that you have to walk. Your path of greatness opens up the path for other people. And also on the path, and then I'm gonna get to it, the path of greatness today, Proverbs 10, 17. This, is, this talks about a path. He who learns from instruction and correction is on the right path, this is the amplified version, is on the right path of life. And for others, his example is a path towards wisdom and blessing. But he who ignores and refuses correction goes off course. And for others, his example is a path towards sin and ruin. Like Pastor Josh says, you can do it God's way or you can do it the wrong way. There's two paths for you. Do you want the path to greatness or do you want the path for yourself? And the path for yourself is also called the path of ruin. You've gotta decide what path do you wanna go down. And this is, you know, we believe this so strongly, not just at Mighty Men, Mighty Men's a part of Elevate Life. We believe this so strongly here at Elevate Life. The primary path that you can walk at Elevate Life is called the greatness journey, where you discover God, where you develop yourself, where you develop self-leadership, and you deploy into greatness. You deploy into all that God has for you. This is what we're all about here at Mighty Men. This is what we're all about here at Elevate Life, is that you could discover, develop, and deploy into all that God has for you, that you could walk the path of greatness. That's why we call this place the incubator of greatness. So what I'm gonna give you this morning is three pillars of greatness. Right, like we've got the pillars in our church, like the physical things where you gotta serve, you gotta be generous, you need to get baptized. There's all these steps that we have. I'm gonna give you right now some of the mindset, the pillars of greatness in your life, the pillars of greatness of you being a part of Mighty Men and Elevate Life, so let me get there. Number one, first pillar is you gotta prepare. It is always preparation season in your life. Some seasons feel like it a little bit more than others. Many of you have heard me tell some of the stories of the level of preparation that we would go through in SEAL training to go for, to, before we would go on an op. When I would do these underwater dives that are four hours long, right, which I won't belabor how terrible it was. I'll just tell you, it sucked really bad. Being underwater for four hours with basically your eyes closed, because it's so black you can't see anything except your compass when it's this close to your face, right? It's not very fun. You also, you're supposed to be flat, but really you're just like one degree, two degrees, head down. And that doesn't seem like a bad deal unless you do it for about four hours. And maybe you don't suffer from acid reflux and you never have in your life, I promise you will. If I put you at about a two degree, like you just feel like all of the acid from the bowels of your stomach just wants to come down your throat. It's a very uncomfortable feeling. Not only that, uh, for four hours all I'm doing is I'm just looking at my compass, looking at my watch, I'm looking at my depth gauge, which tells me how deep underwater I am, and I'm just counting kicks, right? I'm swimming, I'm just doing this. One, two, three, for four hours. It's not very fun. And because before I went on this dive, before I went on this dive, I have a map. And on this map, I've drawn seven, eight, nine different legs. A leg is where I'm gonna go, I'm gonna start, they're gonna drop me off out of the boat next to this bridge. And at this bridge, I'm gonna swim at, let's see, 175 degrees 
for 450 meters. And so that's gonna equate to, for me, that would have been like 295 kicks approximately, depending on what the currents were. So I'm just gonna look at my compass, I'm gonna go in that direction, and I'm gonna count for 295 kicks, right? And I could go on and on, the level of preparation that I had to go through to go on this dive. Not only that, I would spend hours preparing my gear. It's kind of the, the, the equipment that we use was a little bit different than scuba gear. I, my, uh, you know, when you go scuba diving, all you gotta do is follow your depth gauge correctly and you won't die. My, the gear that we use, it was called a rebreather where there's no bubbles, so I breathe out and it goes right back into my system. And it's a really cool design except that it's trying to kill you all the time. <laughs> right, it's very easy to poison yourself with this equipment. And so not only, I, I, the point that I'm making, right, I won't go on and on in this story. So much preparation for just a few hours of operation. And let me tell you some of the greatness moments in your life Right, it, it'll be a moment. I've, to, I've told you guys how much uh, I love the movie The Sandlot, and it means something different to me than just like a little boy's coming of age tale. And when I watch the movie Sandlot, I see Benny the Jet. If, uh, if you haven't seen the movie, then I'm gonna ruin it for you, but it's 30 years old at this point, so that's your fault. <laughs> um, Sandlot, at the end of the movie, Benny the Jet is in a pickle. Right, if it's a pickle, it's a rundown. And he's gotta make it home. To, he's gotta make it home to win the game, and he does. But when you look at Benny the Jet's life, his entire life has been a preparation for the rundown, right? He was, pu he was always pushing himself as a young athlete. The kids around him could see the greatness on his life. He gets in a rundown with a dog trying to save his friend's opportunity to play baseball. And all, every step along the way leads to the rundown of his life. And I've always believed for myself that there's a rundown coming for me. Right? And I believe the same for each and every one of you, that God has a great opportunity for you. There's something that God's gonna put in your path where he says, son, it's been a long road, but you're finally ready. This is your moment. And what I, what I want is when my moment comes that I didn't poorly prepare for it, that I gave all that I have. And in the same way that like I talked about vision, that you've gotta see beyond, beyond just, hey, this dirt can turn into grass, you've gotta see the possible for your life. I want you to see the greatness Right, like, like Ephesians says, God can do more than you can ask, think, or imagine. So I'm constantly, whatever I can dream up, God can do more. And so my vision for my life, whatever I can see for potential greatness in my life, I know that God can do more. So whatever level of preparation you think it would take to reach the level of greatness you think you can achieve, you should prepare more because God's able to do more than you can ask, think, or imagine. And so this is the power of preparation. The other side of this is I worked with, um, I'll keep this story short because I don't want to go long today. But on uh, my first deployment, we, went into, we got into a really tough operation, and I, I won't tell that story, but we came home from the mission, and I noticed something that really disturbed me. One of the guys on my team went to the range and recited his weapon after we got home from that mission because we all almost died on that mission. And it wasn't that his weapon was sighted in, but he felt uncomfortable about his weapon. He felt like it could have been better. There was, no, there was no repercussions for this, nothing was said, but I remember just catching the lesson of this guy, like now that he almost died, maybe I'll tighten up my weapon a little bit more. This is Ephesians chapter six, verse 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. I preached this, this verse a few weeks ago, but I'm gonna preach it to you differently today. Therefore, put on Ephesians 6, 13, therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, meaning get your armor on. The day of evil's not here. Get your armor on now. Not wait for it to show up. This is where so many men, I mean, I'm telling you, this catches a lot of men off guard. When it, when it gets here, I'll, I'll prepare. When my marriage starts to struggle, then I'll act right. When I run out of money, then maybe I'll start managing my finances. Stop waiting for destruction to knock on your door before you learn to prepare. You need to be the type of man, you, want, you know where part of where Rock Kazak comes from? Part of where do nothing else except be strong and courageous comes from? Primarily, it is a foundation in trusting in God, but you know what'll help you trust in God? When you've done what he said every day before that. And when you've done what he says every day before that, when the enemy comes, just like David, I can tell you something about David when he faced Goliath. 
David knew he could face Goliath. This is some of my own perspective on David's battle. When David was looking at Goliath, he says, I've killed lions and bears with my hands. I can kill this man. I'll tell you what David was really believing in God for. He was surrounded by a bunch of cowards. The entire army of Israel was standing behind him, afraid to face one man. And here's a young boy who's gonna go out and kill the giant. And God's, well, here's what David's saying to God. God, I know you're gonna help me kill this giant, but here's what I'm believing for. Here's what David's trusting in, is that after he kills the giant Goliath, that somehow the Spirit of God is gonna come upon all of the army of Israel behind him so they can continue to go out and face the Philistines. This story can appear, David and Goliath's story, can appear like champion's combat. Champion's combat is like, you send your best man, I'll send my best man, whoever wins, wins, and we don't need to all slaughter each other. And that's a part of history, but you know where it exists? It exists in tribal societies, right? Where there's 10 tribes, two tribes are gonna go to war, and eight other tribes will enforce the champion's combat. There was no one to enforce champion's combat that day. The Philistines were the superior army. There were only two swords that day held by Saul, King Saul and his son. And so David's saying, I'm gonna kill Goliath, but there's a bunch of cowards back here behind me with sticks, and I've gotta go against the superior army with swords, and God, I know I can kill Goliath, but I can't kill 10,000, 20,000 men by my own power. You're gonna have to do something here. Right, so I'm telling you this in this same way. You've gotta do everything you can do to prepare, but then you're gonna believe in God to do everything that you can't do. This is the power of preparation. This is one of the pillars for greatness. Let me go on to the next pillar. Number two is hold fast. Right, I've preached this scripture, I mean I've preached this message many times. Right, these are the three pillars of greatness. Every single one of these pillars, you need to hold on to all the time. You gotta have these pillars in your life if you want greatness. If you start falling down in one of these areas, hey, that's where you need to pick yourself back up. And let me just foreshadow it for you right now. This is gonna be the question you're gonna talk about in your groups today. Where do I need to grow in some of these pillars of greatness? And the second pillar is hold fast. And let me give you a great scripture on this. This is one of those scriptures, like I've said, when you read scripture, who read their Bible this week? It's what I wanna see, I wanna see every hand raised. I wanna see every hand raised, not just when you've read your Bible one time, that you've read it two times, that you've read it three times this week, that you're reading it every day. Nothing will empower you, nothing will strengthen you the way that the word of God will when you begin to not just read it for yourself, you gotta read it, you gotta understand it, but then when it comes out of your mouth, that's when it has power. And if you wanna learn, like if you wanna memorize scripture, just start speaking it, right? Whatever you read this morning, speak it to your wife. Figure out how to apply it in your life. If you keep it up here, you don't really know it. It's like if I watched a bunch of YouTube videos of karate, but never did any of the moves, right? And you guys can just laugh in your mind like a picture of Garrett doing karate in the garage, right? If you just watch a bunch of YouTube videos of karate, but you never do any of it, how much of it do you really know? It's theoretical. And scripture is theoretical until it comes out of your mouth and you start to walk it and you start to live it. And so I say that about scripture to say this is a scripture that is very powerful Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 22, hold fast, or sorry, uh, let me pull that up. That's not, that's not scripture, one second. It is hold fast, but that's not uh, the way that scripture starts. Deuteronomy 11, 22. Be careful to obey all these commands I'm giving to you to love the Lord your, your God, walk in all his ways, and hold fast to him. So think about this. Obey all these commands. Love the Lord your God, walk in all his ways, and. You would think those two things, love the Lord your God, walk in all his ways, be really easy if uh, God said, hey, just do these things. And you know what's really interesting? That's what Moses said the first time. Deuteronomy is called the second law. It's what Deuteronomy means. It means he gave the law before at the beginning when they went into the desert, and then he gave it a second time in Deuteronomy. It's the second law. They're about, the Israelites are about to leave the desert, and Moses is telling all of the laws again. And he didn't say hold fast the first time. He said, love the Lord your God, walk in all his ways, and now he's telling the same law again, and he says, and hold fast to him. And what does this word mean? I love this word. It's an old Navy word. This comes from old English sailing, where to hold fast was where sailors would hold fast to a ship. Think about what it would take, not in today's day and age, but think about what it would take hundreds of years ago to sail an old wooden ship across the sea. 
The captain would set a course. He'd say, hey, we're going to go this direction. He would show it on the map. We're going to go from here to there. We're going to plot a course across the ocean. The captain says, go that way. It is the sailor's job to make the ship go that way. And unlike a Tesla where you just press a button, a ship, you can put it on course, but you've got winds, you've got currents, and this thing is made out of wood and cotton and rope. And so it's gonna stretch and it's gonna bend. Even if the wind and the current doesn't change, the sails will loosen up or you have to retighten them. When the wind begins to change, you gotta keep the course, the, the ship on course. When the current's working against you, you've gotta adjust for the current. And this is what it means to hold fast in your life. God says go this way and you've gotta do all the things in your life. It's not just press a button and go. God, I, I read the Bible today, so why didn't everything just happen in my life? You gotta continually make adjustments. Sometimes the wind is in your face. Sometimes the wind is, wind's at your back. Sometimes you feel like you're doing everything you're supposed to be doing and you just gotta tighten the ropes down a little bit more. You gotta stretch the sails out a little bit more. This is what it means to hold fast. When you're going through stuff in your life, you gotta continually tighten it down. Hold fast doesn't mean where the, sa the, the sailors are trying to hold onto the ship so they don't get knocked off. Hold fast means all the things that you know to do, do it, do it with awareness, do it consistently, and even when what you're doing isn't working as well as you want it to, press harder and do all that you can to keep this ship on course. This is what it means to hold fast. And that's why Moses is telling this again the second time because if you know the Israelite story, they got into the desert. Love the Lord your God, obey all of his commands and hold fast to him. Because what would happen is every time Moses would go away to spend time with God, the, the, the Israelites would just wander off into stupidity. They would find idols, they would do weird stuff. We don't need to talk about all the weird stuff they did, but they would do weird stuff. Why? Because they were not holding fast to God. Holding fast to God means sometimes it's easy to go forward when the wind's at your back, right? It's easy, if you put the course, the ship on course and you have a direct tailwind, you don't gotta do nothing. But what about when the wind changes? Poor sailors would start saying, Captain, what do we do? And he's looking at you, he said, I, go, I, I told you to go this way, you've gotta readjust the ship. The ship is your life, right? You've got to, with God's, God's gonna change my thinking, God's gonna help me think better, God's gonna give me wisdom, and I have to make the course corrections on my ship in my life. This is what it means to hold fast. So when it's not working, when you're off course, just make adjustments, right? The winds are gonna change, the current's gonna change. This is one of the pillars of greatness. You can get on the greatness path so easily, it's very hard to stay on the greatness path. Invite your friends to church, they're gonna get on the greatness journey. You wanna stay on the greatness journey, it is gonna require you to hold fast. And number three. We've gotta prepare, we've gotta hold fast. And number three, we've gotta press. You have to press in to all that God has for you. These, are, these can feel like different seasons of your life. You're gonna access these at different times during a day and you're gonna lean on some of these in different seasons of your life but in all times in your life, you need to press. And press, this is a great scripture. Let me read it, and then we're gonna come back to it again at the end. Philippians chapter three, verse eight through 14. Yes, everything is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law, for rather I've become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I wanna know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I wanna suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but, I press on to possess the, that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. This is the one thing in your life, right? Some of you know what I'm talking about this, what I'm talking about here. I won't go make that point, I've preached it before, but you wanna know what the one thing is in your life? This is the one thing. I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly pr prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. 
every single one of you has a race to run in your life. You have to press on that race, right? I learned this when uh, I used to spend, when I was in high school, I used to spend a lot of time rock climbing. And I hung out with, uh, I was not a great rock climber, but I happened to hang out with, you wanna learn how to do anything good, hang out with people who are professional at it. Uh, one of the girls that I would hang out with, she, was, uh, she is now, the, uh, her name's Alex Puccio, she's now the number one best rock cl- female rock climber in the world. When we were in high school, this girl could do like 20 pull-ups with her pinkies. She made all, all of us look uh, very weak. And so that also reset my, uh, what I thought was capable. I said, if a woman can do that, what can a man do? Um, that was my Garrett. That was my Garrett filter. But anyways, I learned this in rock climbing. When you first get on the wall, like your hands are fresh, your arms are fresh, and it's easy to hold on to the wall. The longer you spend on the wall, and in this context, the wall is your life, the longer you spend on the wall, they can be that the handholds haven't changed, but life gets harder. The handholds haven't changed. You know, I used to climb in high school. I'm a little bit heavier than I am in high school. I went climbing the other day, and I just realized, like, man, this isn't the same as it used to be. But the longer you're on the wall, like well, one of my friends taught me this, she called it acceleration of grip, right? When I first get on the wall, I only have to squeeze so hard. I know you get this, Justin, from some of the stuff you guys do in Ninja Warrior. When I first get on the wall, I only have to squeeze so hard to hold onto this handhold. But the longer I'm here, my perceived level of effort has to increase for me to stay holding on to this, right? Because as I get tired, I, like my body is exerting the same amount of force physically, but my level of effort grows because it gets harder. And like, just like, you know what, when you're 20 years old, you don't have to try very hard to be in shape. When you're 60 years old, you gotta try really hard to be in shape. Things have changed. And let me tell you, in your life, things are going to change. And what you've gotta learn if you wanna walk the path of greatness is how to press in every single area of of your life. Press when it's easy, press when it's hard. Press when things are against you. Press when the wind is behind you. Press is you saying, God, I want all that you have for my life. And also, like Paul's talking about here, being humble and understanding, hey, I have not yet attained yet. And this is also 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Fantastic scripture. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one, who receive, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the game exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. This is the path to greatness right, that you're gonna open up for other people. You have gotta run your race. My race isn't your race. We all have different races. You have to run your race to win. And let me tell you something about press. Let me give you some of the secret to press. This is Matthew 10, 39. This is one of the secrets. And let me tell you about secrets. People always wanna know what the secrets are. The secrets are right there for you. The secret is that you don't do it, right? There's a lot of secrets, secrets to winning financially. You know what they are, you just don't do them if you're not winning financially. It's not that the secrets are that hard to understand. And this secret of the kingdom, this secret of God's way of doing things, it's there. We just struggle because we don't access it. Matthew 10, 39, Jesus says, he who seeks to gain his life will lose it. It's one of the secrets of the kingdom, right? The reason people don't press, I saw this in SEAL training, and I'm gonna end here giving you the secret to press because this is what I want for every single one of you. And I'm preaching to myself, by the way. I don't think I've figured out greatness. I gotta preach greatness to myself all the time because I just feel this thing that I want you to feel for your life that God has a great plan for you. Maybe no one ever spoke it over you like they did over me. From the time that I was a little boy, my parents spoke it over me. People throughout my life would find me, grab me by the shirt, people I didn't know, and tell me that God has a plan for me. And if no one ever did that for you, let me do it for you. God has a great plan for your life. He's doing something with you, and here's what it's going to take that you would press, that you'd be willing to pour out your life for something that's more important than you. And I learned this in SEAL training. There were so many men that never made it. They didn't reach greatness, not because they weren't capable, but because they were unwilling to pour out all that they have. I would listen. I was hearing the instructors. They they were picking on guys because they could see it. The instructors could see it. There's more in you. You're holding back. And they would press on them. 
and people would quit when they got pressed on because when you've been through this training, you can see it. You can see it in a man that there's more in him. And men will quit instead of just give all that they have. But when you decide, I'll empty it, I'll, give all, that the, I'll get all, give all that I have. And I'm not talking about SEAL training, I'm talking about your life. Where this comes from is a trust in God, saying, Lord, I'm gonna pour out everything. When I pour it out, I'll have nothing left. And I'm counting on you to give it back to me. I'm counting on you to fill me up again. If your press does not do this to you, where you're saying, God, I can't do anymore, I don't have anything left, I don't know what else I can do at this point. I'm doing all I know to do. If your press has not brought you to this point, you have not pressed enough. Continue to press, mighty men. God has a great plan for your life. So the path to greatness, right? We gotta prepare. Prepare in season and out of season. That's what scripture says. Prepare all the time. You've gotta hold fast. Don't let go. It's where the Israelites screwed it up. Read the story of the Israelites in the desert. God told them everything to do. They had a leader, but the problem was when the leader wasn't around, they were being ding-dongs. You gotta hold fast, and you gotta press. Press all the time. Like I said, if your press has not brought you to your knees, you can press harder. So keep pressing. And instead of relying on yourself, relying on God, say, God, I'm gonna empty myself, and I know you're the one that's gonna fill me back up. <clears throat> Scripture for the week this week is Philippians chapter three, verse 14. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And the question for the groups is the most important thing that we do here on Saturdays at Mighty Men. It's not to come hear a message. You can hear great preachers online. You can come hear Pastor Keith on a Sunday, right? We don't come here for the message on Saturday. We come here for relationship. Something that God has given me revelation in is that discipleship happens through relationship and brotherhood. Us being together, iron sharpens iron, says Proverbs 27, 17. That's what we're here for. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you this question and you're gonna go to your groups. If you're new and it's your first time, come up here on the stage. I wanna meet you, I wanna get to know you, how you got here, and if you don't know anybody, I, that's what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna connect you with some other mighty men so that you can get around groups, so you can get around men who can help push you up. Maybe you're ready to disciple other people. That's great. We need men who can disciple other people. I got people who are discipling me. I got people that I'm discipling. That's a part of our process here. So I'm gonna give you this question. This is the question I want you to talk about in your groups, right? Which pillar of greatness? Prepare, hold fast, press. Which pillar of greatness do I need to grow most in my life right now, right? I've needed to grow each of these in different seasons of my life for yourself, for the struggles that you're going through. Which pillar of greatness do I need to grow most in my life right now? And again, if it's your first time, please come up here on the stage. After I pray, I would love to meet